from the city of Beaky Blinders, Birmingham, England, I would like to introduce you to Paddy Dandar. As the world becomes more automated and the robots take over, it's imperative that we build the right human skills for the future. So pull up a chair, grab a smoser or two, and make yourself very uncomfortable. So, Shurikant, I'm going to ask you, for this episode, what superpower are you bringing? What superpower am I bringing? Uh, first of all, you know, other than that, <laughs> <laughs> no superpower per se, I think. But, but here's what I'd say. So, clearly, I've been the beneficiary of in a country which gave me a lot of opportunity to study the way I wanted and so on. I was fortunate to have parents who had vision to help us grow as me and my brother grow and also have ambition which was outside of what one could see. There's a very famous book by blind mountain climber called Eric Wyan Mayer. He's blind. He's blind. He's climbed every the, the top seven tallest mountains in the world. And and it's and the title of the book it basically says that uh, journey to the top of the mountain, going farther than where the eyes can see. Now, obviously, he's talking a literal sentence, but he's also talking a metaphorical sense that if we limit ourselves to what we can see, our vision our, for life, our ambition, our aspiration is going to be very limited. But if we can expand our horizons to everything that we know and learn. The world is limitless, it's boundless. So I was lucky to grow up in an environment like that, and that shaped me a bit. So I think as a result of the experience I've had, whether it be the places I studied, the people I worked with, and I've been fortunate to have worked with people from probably about 30 or 40 different countries, with different cultures. I can think of Australians I worked closely with, people from Eastern Europe, people from across Europe. Americans, and if you go to America, you'll realize that uh, your Texans are different from people from California and Florida, Latin Americans, etc. So, and you learn from each of these cultures. So, I think the one thing, if I, I wouldn't call it a superpower, but probably an advantage or an insight that I bring to the table, which I think stands me in good stead, is the ability to network and connect with people. And when I say connect, it's not just an association, it's being able to so if you connect at a meaningful level with people across cultures and that has really stood me in good stead. Yeah. Oh, wow. I love that connection. And then you intersperse that with the fact that a lot of my career has been spent in the technology industry where people tend to be by nature curious. They, they tend to be competitive for sure. Arrogant sometimes for sure, but curious. Absolutely. Because that's what drives technology, right? The next evolution. I mean, before you line it, write a few lines of code in three weeks, there's probably a newer technology platform that's come about, right? So being in that in that kind of an environment across culture, across tech, is has been fascinating. And on one side, it is a challenge because you've got to keep upskilling yourself, staying up to scratch, etc. But on the other side, I couldn't ask for a better place to be, right? And so that's that's my advantage or my superpower. And I guess you can if Somebody out there is a little bit of an introvert. Believe it or not, I'm a massive introvert and I, I used to be the last person to go and speak to somebody at a networking event. What advice might you have for them so if they really want to you know, start to connect with others? And we all talk about the power of networking and connection. So what tips would you have for somebody who's maybe a little bit shy or not quite got that confidence? So I think first of all, yes, on this video, I may seem like I... Um, I'm a bit of an extrovert, but I'm as much of an introvert as you are. If someone gave me a choice in the evening after we've had dinner and said, what would you like to do now? I'd probably read a good book. I'm being very honest. I love reading. And so I'm very much of being with myself. But what I'd say is this, right? I think, and I, I've made all these mistakes in my careers, but often I would, um, early in my career, think that it was important to be liked. And, and to be liked, it's important to be like the other person would expect you to be. And uh, very quickly, that myth was dispelled because you can carry trying to be like someone else for probably five minutes. But as people get to know you and you get to know them, either they see through that and see you for who you are. I'm not saying good or bad. They see you for who you are. You get bored or tired of putting up the pretense. And we all sort of come back to what we are naturally. 
And we all know that the truth is far easier to live than a lie. Because in a lie, you've got to keep concentrating the truth. You're just natural. You're just yourself. So the first thing I'd say is remember that everyone's a little different, right? Even people who you one would think are very senior or very educated or very extrovertish. The reality is they live the same life as we do. They all have insecurities. They all have self-doubt and they've all worked to get to where they are. And so that, that it's important to say that one may not know things that other people do, but one knows things. One has experienced things that the other people hasn't. So you always have something that or you have that's of interest to the other person and they can learn from you as well. And so as long as you bring that to a conversation or an interaction, that's all you need. You don't need to worry about, hey, how will that person perceive me? I mean, frankly, as long as you're genuine to yourself. Yeah, some people may not connect with you. They may select you out, but that that's what it was meant to be. Right? I, I, I come from an Indian school of thought. That's how I've got it. Quite fatalistic in that sense that what is to be will be in the sense if you're supposed to meet someone, it, it is well. There's, there's actually an old Chinese proverb and it can be contextualized even here where it says that when the student is ready, the teacher comes. So what that says is it's not just about teaching, but you step away and look at it. That for anything to happen, you've got to put yourself out there. You've got to try. And when you're ready, and when I say ready, it's not you telling yourself I'm ready. It's who you are. Things happen, right? So now if you want to meet people out there, you don't need to be the snazziest dressed person. You don't need to be the loudest person in the room. You don't need to be the smartest person. You be you. And when you are you, there's something about you that intrigue will fascinate people and 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 then that 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 works and i've seen that i've seen that uh, very very often and you'd be surprised how many people when you're straight with them will actually communicate with you without pretenses and social media today makes it that much easier i was thinking just as you're talking that through do you have any examples of where you've connected with somebody but actually that conversation has taken you to a completely different place one way you didn't expect it to go, it could be, I don't know, you closed a deal or you realized an opportunity for you personally. A any examples of that? Early in my career, I actually moved to the US with a, a small company, another company which has obviously gone through many shapes of form, so I won't name them. They were a small tech services firm and they were competing with Infosys who was already pretty large by that time, right? So I went to meet the tech, the IT manager, the IT leader of this client that Infosys had. And the company I worked for was probably one tenth the size of Infosys. And there was a specific project that we were good at in, tech, in that technology. It was an SAP related project. Back in the day, SAP was the buzzword. I'm talking about the early 2000s, as you can imagine. And, you know, sheer hassle, multiple times I tried, wrote to the guy, called the guy. Remember, in those days, mobiles weren't as prevalent. You called a person from a desk phone and you call. And you call in the mornings, you call in the evenings, you try and get them at a time when they're available and they're also in the mindset that they want to have a chat. Long story short, after trying for about a month or two, I got a meeting with this guy. He just came in and I asked him, this is ours as a company, blah, blah. He said, look, I'm meeting you because I'm curious. You just wouldn't give up, right? <laughs> you just couldn't give up. And so I said, fine, presented credentials. I said, this is what we do well. I believe you're doing this. He said, okay, leave this with me. We met two or three times. We got to know each other. And at the end of it, he said to me, he said, look, I like you. Your company's got good credentials. But you know what? I'm not going to give you this business because you guys are too small. In, I, I've got to make this decision. It's a pretty big decision. I've got to go with a company that's bigger in size. And remember, emphasis wasn't very big then, but we were much smaller. And he said, well, I think, I know you can do the job, but I'm going to go with this company because they're a safer choice that my colleagues will, so, or co co let's say, coagulate around if, if I use a phrase. So fine, you lose a deal, you lose a deal, but you keep the connection. You keep the connection. Now, the story doesn't end there. A few months later, I was actually going to join Infos. I was interviewed by them, right? And uh, it was a pretty interesting interview, as you can imagine. When one senior salesperson interviews another salesperson, often it becomes a case of how much do you bought the market in this? And, and we quickly got to the point where this client that I was bidding on happened to be in that person's portfolio. So they were like, okay, so who do you in this client? 
So I gave the name of this client I talked about. And the person who interviewed me says, so if I call them now, what will they say about you? And it's an outbox. And I said, look, rea reality, I didn't sell them the deal. So if you ask me, was the deal done? No, because you guys continue to work with them. But have we earned credibility? Absolutely, we have. So he said, fine, I'll make that call. A few days later, he did call the client. And the client said that word, yes, I didn't give them the business. But for clarity and for persistence, I can't fault them. And so the client who had never bought from me acted as a reference for me in some shape or form. So you see, what I'm trying to say here is you be you, right? That's, that's an amazing outcome from that conversation because often you didn't get the business, so it's a disappointment, but actually there was a, a, another plan for that conversation. So you can, I know you read a lot. And I know this because every time I talk to you, you reel off about 10 books and I'm like, oh, let me get a pen and a paper. I want to write some of these, these words down, these names down. And I think one of your superpowers is the fact that you read so much, your wealth of knowledge, and it just makes it so easier for you to be able to connect with people from different diverse backgrounds. I mean, I could be talking about anything. I could probably mention shoes and I bet you've read a book on shoes or some crazy I've fact. Read, about I've read Phil Knight's book called Shoe Dog. It's about the story of Nike. So I have actually. <laughs> see, see my point? So I'd love to hear from you uh, in terms of some of the more interesting books that you've read, some that you would recommend to some of the listeners. So oh, interesting. So I think, look, obviously we all look at the world through our lenses. So I think if I go back uh, 20, 30 years, first of all, I, I read a lot of fiction because frankly, growing up, I read that and I still love it. And I still do. As in when we say fiction, it's just light fiction because sometimes that's a great detox. So people who believe that reading fiction is a waste of time, I completely disagree with that. I think it's important because it's a wall. You need to release your stress and you read something. But when you come to some serious reading, I used to earlier in the, in my life or career, try and read stuff that everyone reads. And I quickly realized it was stuff that didn't interest me. And for me, what that meant was I'd start a book, I'd drop it after two chapters. But if someone asks me, hey, have you read this book? I'd pretend like, yes, I have, because you want to look like you've read it and you're cool. But you quickly realize you can't keep up, right? Because you're lying. Again, I go back to the fact that being true to yourself is important. So I quickly dropped that probably in my early 20s or so. And I said, hell, I'm going to read what I like, what I want to read, right? So if I go back, things I like, I like history a lot. I read about, I, I like travel books a lot. I read books in business, but probably more in economics, more because I, I just feel that economics and politics and history give you a landscape of the world, uh, you know, in, 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 in that sense. I also read a lot of books on creative thinking and probably tech. When I say tech, I don't mean technology and technology, but the implications of, of, of technology. So often it's a case of things that interest me and things lead me on a path. So that, that's my reading habit. If, I, if you look at some of the books that have really stuck with me, I think I'm just in no particular order. Daniel Kahneman's Think Fast, Think Slow is, I think, a fantastic book. It, it's so. It resonates with a lot of us as to how we think, how we react, our impulses, and and, and so on and so forth. In in terms of um, biographies, I've read a lot of those. I thought Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs was brilliant, fantastic, and we all know Steve Jobs. Of course, there is the success that he's had, and you know, God bless the soul, he's no, no longer with us. Phenomenal, phenomenal visionary. But again, a flawed visionary to read his history. I mean, I'm not sure how many people would have known this unless you read the biography that Steve didn't go to fancy colleges. He grew up in California and for the for his 20s, he didn't know what he wanted to do. He just packed, went on a year's trip of self-discovery to India. He came back from India. He spent six months plucking apples in an orchard. So he, he's done all of these things. And now one could say, if you looked at him at that point in time, one would say, man, he's wasting his life. But if you look at Steve Jobs today and the legacy he's left behind, he's created what is, in my view, going to be the iconic company of our generation and the generation after, right? In, in that sense. So the question is, which Steve Jobs do you admire? Do you admire the person who you look at, rearview mirror, or do you admire the journey that brought him there? And the question one asks oneself is, 
If you were to go through that journey, would you have the courage and the conviction to live through it, not knowing what the outcome could be, right? And I think we're all at that stage every day. You know, every day we've got a million folks our life could take based on what we choose, what we don't. And we always think that there's a set path that based on certain things that other people have done. All I'd say is we all have our own path. Just choose your destination, go with your gut and that works. So that, that's what influences my reading. I, I look at things that interest me. They may be conventional, they may not. So Daniel Kahneman, Steve Jobs. Um, another book I am actually reading right now is uh, a book on venture capital. By it's, it's come out last week. It's by Sebastian Malaby. It talks about how the valleys come about and so on and so forth. I think that's that's a fascinating book. Um, I I read a book on AI. I'll, I'll get you the exact title, but because I'm, I've been fascinated by AI, I also recently read a book on cyber by Nicole Paul Roth because I think cybersecurity is one of the biggest things in our age. It was actually the FP uh, McKinsey Business Book of the Year last year, but it, if you read that, you realize how vulnerable we can be in the cyber world and how much we take for granted. But if used the right way, how it could be a force for good. So all kinds of things. If I step back and think about books on history, a lot, a lot, I could keep going on and on. But hopefully, you know, that gives you a sense, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I, I love that advice about not just reading what everyone else is reading, try and be different. One of my favorite books of all time, interestingly, is uh, uh, A Tale of Two Cities. And I love the starting line of it. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Because I think that's true of us every day. Nice. Thank you. Thank you, Shrikant. Now, when you and I were talking just before this episode, as we were leading up to it, you were talking about your passion and the future, where you want to go and your journey ahead. And you talked a lot about what's happening in India in terms of the startup revolution. Could you share a few thoughts about that? And again, for anyone who doesn't know what's happening there. It'd be great to hear your insights on that. Something very close to my heart, Paddy, and as people who've heard this discussion until now have realized, I'm passionate about a few things. India, clearly, it's an in integral part of my identity. I live in Britain, I'm British in some ways, but I'm also very Indian in other ways, very proud of it. Technology is very big in my life, that's important. Well, obviously, having a slightly global outlook is also important and helping build something new is something I like. And that's why I'm so excited about the Indian tech space right now, because that, that's what's happening there. Because a few things have come together. I think, first of all, you've got a, a talent pool, like I said, a significantly large tech talent pool, right? It's huge. It's huge. Really smart people. You've got a domestic market that is huge. That is very digital. So just to give you a sense... There are about 600 million mobile phones in India today. Just by calibration, that is eight or nine times the population of the UK. The UK's population is about 70 million, give or take. Right? So 600 million mobile phones. And these are all smartphones. Now, you may have a mobile phone, but what about connectivity? India is launching 5G, right? And that's going to cover the whole country. So in the next few years, you're going to have 600 or maybe even 800 by then, depending on more adoption, 800 million people with the world at their fingertips, literally, on a smartphone. I mean, think of the opportunities that creates to educate people, for people to consume, for people to communicate, for people to learn. I mean, it's, it's, the, the potential is tremendous, right? It's tremendous. And that's why I'm so excited. So if you bring the talent pool together, you bring the domestic market, you bring the global ambition that now there are a lot of people of Indian origin who've gone across the globe who are in some shape or form connected back to the country. Some of them actually re relocate. You'd be surprised how many Bay Area entrepreneurs have gone back to India to be part of this evolution. There are others who are investing, who are starting companies, who are participating. And I think it's just only going to grow. And if you take some statistics, the world measures startups by unicorns. As we know, unicorns, a company that's valued at a billion dollars and more. Um, I believe the world today has about a thousand unicorns. I read a report by this New York-based research firm called CB Insights, who actually tracked the space. And the world has a thousand unicorns as of end of December, early Jan, right? Of those thousand, about give or take 480 or 500 are American companies. As you can imagine, America is the world's largest tech market. 
about 150 are Chinese. So that takes you to about 650, 65%. The third largest country uh, in terms of unicorns is India with about, I believe, uh, 80 or so, right? The UK is about 35 or so today, right? So you've got a country with 80 unicorns. Uh, but what's even more interesting is that of those 80, 40 were created last year in 2021. Because the pandemic has caused people to switch to digital at a pace that is unheard of. And now that's the way they live, right? That's the way they live. So to me, the potential is huge. And that's where I went. What does that mean? That means there are opportunities for direct-to-consumer companies. There are opportunities for deep tech companies, whether it be an AI-based conversational chatbot or a platform or a robotic solution that supports Amazon to sort the million or gazillion packages that they do. So very excited. That's my passion. And that's the world I'm going to spend a lot more time in going forward. Would love to chat more about it with you. No, that's definitely one for the for the pub, I think, where you and I sit and talk for hours on end because I was blown away by those figures when you mentioned them to me the other day. And I personally just couldn't even believe that. That's just remarkable and really exciting, really exciting for India as a country. But again, there's going to be impact across the world. I'm sure lots of other uh, countries are going to benefit from that as well. So that's, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, great stuff. But you can work. End of time now, we just come to the end of the show. Is there any one bit of advice you'd like to give somebody who is perhaps starting off their career and thinking about all of this excitement that's ahead of them, all of this stuff happening in India, obviously the rest of the world, there's lots going on in terms of tech. What one bit of advice would you give somebody who's just starting off their career? Again, I'm in no position to give advice because it's a journey. I'm still midway through the journey myself. So we're all learners together, maybe at different stages of learning. But the two things I'd say is, uh, and these are oft repeated words, but the first is actually stay hungry and stay foolish because the day one thinks you know everything, you're done, you're dead, you're finished, right? And I think knowing that you've got to go to everything with an open mind and you have that hunger to learn, to know more, to communicate to understand other people and go with a clean slate very important to have the attitude doesn't matter how educated you are how senior you are how privileged you are how much money you have doesn't matter just keep that attitude because that's the one thing you can bring to every conversation every interaction and I think the second thing I'd say is the journey matters more than the destination itself because like I said before, all of us have a unique set of journeys and it takes us to where we are supposed to go, but let's enjoy the journey because we don't know the outcomes. Oh, fantastic. Great advice there, Shokan. I could speak to you for hours, honestly. I'm sure we, we could carry on for another hour or two easily, but we are at end of time. So thank you so much once again for joining me today. No, Paddy, thank you. I think given that we talked a lot about languages, I'm going to say thank you in a few languages. I'm going to say Dhaniwad in Hindi. I'm going to say Nandri in Tamil. I'm going to say thank you in English as well. Let's try Japanese. Arigato gozaimasu. And gracias in Spanish and sheshe in Chinese. So thank you very much. Oh, fantastic. Thank you.